Welcome to another installment of uh, studying the Psalms together. My name is Carl Santos. I'm the pastor at New City Church in Calgary. So welcome. I know many of you have tuned in for all of these or a number of them. So uh, thanks for doing that. I'm glad they're being helpful from all the feedback I'm getting. Um, Yeah, so enjoy. We're jumping in today to a Psalm of Thanksgiving. And these are very common in the the Psalter. And this is just one I chose... um, pretty much off the cuff, uh, but it's one I've preached on before, and some of you may have even heard this uh, uh, sermon. I've done it a couple times, but um, we're going to walk through it. I haven't re-listened to sermons or anything. We're, like I said, we're just going to dive into this together and see what it says. Psalm 67, so let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for uh, the Psalter that can give us comfort in all times, including the one we're in. Lord, let us not become too comfortable in being isolated. Remind us that... Um, Although you're recalibrating us right now through this COVID season, um, we are not to get comfortable here, but to learn uh, the things that need to be paired out of our lives, but also those need, which we need to be watered and flourished um, when things get back to quote unquote normal. Lord, I pray that they wouldn't go back to normal, but that we would be in uh, would be changed by this. God, we thank you for this. Bless us and be with us today as we look at your word. Amen. Okay, so let me read Psalm 67 for you. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the pe- all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So, the Psalm of Thanksgiving. And one of the things that scholars note, I remember this quite well, is it is a very strange um, sort of Thanksgiving psalm because it doesn't really, it doesn't just talk about thankfulness for what they've received, but it seems to ask for more. It's a psalm that, you know, normal, this was a psalm that would be used at the time of the harvest and it would be sung uh, corporately as well. So it's a corporate psalm, psalm of, of thanksgiving for all they've been given. So normally in those sorts of things, you reflect back on what you've been given and you give thanks. And this psalm seems to look forward. In fact, the very, just the very way it opens and closes, but we're going to get there. Let me say this. When I first started looking at this psalm, I remember being a little shocked because Martin Luther, a great reformer who wrote so much on the psalms, wrote dozens of volumes on the Psalms. And for some reason, he left Psalm 67 out. He doesn't even touch it. So um, I was a little disheartened at first thinking, oh boy, what do I? Have? What chance do I have of finding any truth and or, or goodness here if a guy like Martin Luther doesn't even give it the time of day? But I think there's great fruit here. So let's jump in. So right at the start, right at the top, you see where it says the quote to the choir master, the little introduction. Um, uh, with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. Nothing much there helps you, but it is there to tell you it is a song, which means if it's a song for a choir, it was sung by multiple people, probably in a corporate worship setting, which, it, of course, it looks like it was. Um, so let's move into right away. So the first thing, I think you all, if you're a Christian, if you've been a Christian for a while, you probably recognize the sound of this first line. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That probably sounds like the ironic blessing, Aaron, Aaronic blessing uh, in Numbers 6. And that should. So what is happening here, of course, is, uh, again, very interesting. Rather than starting a Thanksgiving psalm by saying, thanks for what you've given us, it's saying, bless us more. (laughs) It seems to be asking for more from God, which is not completely unusual, but it is a little strange for a Thanksgiving psalm. Why is it demanding more? Um, But that's what it's doing. It's saying, uh, may, may God bless us in the future. Um, so that's how it starts. And one of the things it's, it's interesting about this Thanksgiving Psalm is it seems to, um, the Israelites here seem to not be content with having received something, but also want to be part of giving something, which is 
what we ought to be learning is that for all the things we've been given and we are given in Christ, we ought to be always thinking about pushing it back outwards. And this psalm can almost be seen as, you know, when you drop a pebble or something into a still pond and you see the the rings radiating outward in the concentric circles. In the same way, our faith and our thankful our thankfulness ought to be pushed outward continually. And you're going to see that here. Um, but notice right away, they're looking up to God. They, they hope that God will bless them. Now, verse two, they want to be blessed. Why? See, look, isn't it fascinating? See, you and I want to be blessed so we can have more. We want to be more comfortable, more toilet paper, more food and canned goods, more health, more finances, better, you know, our kids to be healthy. And we want it usually for ourselves. Um, because we're so concerned, we're so racked with fear, we're so consumed by this idea of the the uh, theology of scarcity, this idea that there's only so much to go around, there's only so much time, there's only so much health, there's only so many years, there's only so much money, there's only so many spouses and, and opportunities. So we hoard things because we're so worried that we're going to run out. But here, they, they want to be blessed so that your name may be known on the earth, your saving powers among the nations. You know, what? let me get rid of those lines and make them these straight lines so I don't mess up any more than I would like to. So, they want to be blessed so that the world will will know who God is. This is evangelism at work. Evangelism. See, they want to be blessed so that in their being blessed, the world might see how great God is. You see, there's always an inherent sharing in the Old Testament that we often think is not there. If you've listened to one of my talks, I think we posted it not too long ago. I gave it at a conference last year about the Old Testament and evangelism. You begin to see that evangelism, even though it's a New Testament word, evangelion, which is the gospel, it is not something, the idea, the concept of sharing and and pushing the knowledge of God out to the world is not new. It doesn't come with the Great Commission. In fact, I think we have a very anemic view of evangelism and we reduce it to just being introduced to us at the Great Commission. It starts in the garden and I have no time to go into that here. But if you listen to that talk, you'll hear more. But uh, here's what they want. This, this nation, these people know, and they're thankful for being blessed and they want to push the blessing outward. This is a healthy idea of how to be thankful. So that uh, God would be known on all the earth and his power. And of course, to know God means to be changed by God. See, knowledge in the Old Testament is the word yada. So that's just so you know, when you get the yada, 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 the Seinfeld made famous. Yada means knowledge, to know. So it's the idea of you know, you know, you know. But anyway, side note. But to make God known is to make known not just not just his theology, but who he is, his relationship, how he blesses, how he loves, how he's slow to anger, all of that. They want to spread the knowledge of God to all the earth and all the nations. And of course, inherent in knowing God is to know him as the Savior, because Israel's intimately connected. In fact, the thing that's, well, the two, the two things that dominate Israelite and Jewish writing and thinking even today are the Red Sea and Mount Moriah, the sacrifice of Isaac. And in both cases, it's God saving and providing. So that's what they want to push out and know. They want to be blessed so that the world would know. Um, Next one. Let's move into here. Um, Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. So, again, so cool, so interesting. What we see here now is all we've thought, that the nations want to be blessed. It now says, let the peoples... Okay, I'll put a little star there. And the peoples, that's plural. And when Israel, when a psalmist and a Jew uses the word nation or people in the singular, so this is singular, sing, it always means Israel. They are the nation. They are the people. But when it makes them plural, plural, it always means the world. So, When it says, let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you, you see, they have been blessed personally as Israel, but they want all the nations to praise God because of it. See, they want to be an example. Israel wants to be a country. It doesn't mean they succeed at it, just like the church does not succeed at it all the time. But the heart of it is, we want to be blessed so that the world will praise you. Let the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you. Let the nations, again, 
plural. Be glad and sing for joy because you judge with equity and guide all the nations on the earth. So they again want to push it out. So you see how it starts with a small circle, right? A small circle, they are blessed. Then it moves out to um, that your ways may be known to all the earth. And it begins to radiate outward. Um, in fact, yeah, can't go into it right now. But you see how it gets larger. So they push their thankfulness outward to the nations. Then let the peoples praise you, O God. Let me change my color again here. Um, let all the peoples praise you. Verse 5, again, it carries on. The earth has yielded its increase. Oh, again, it's too small. The earth, the earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Now, see, that's a little strange, isn't it? Let me get a different color here. A little strange that this is happening. The earth has yielded its increase, past tense. So they've been, they've received, this is the harvest ceremony. Remember, they've received it, their increase. It's October, it's November, they're celebrating, hurrah, everything is well. God, our God, shall bless us, future tense. Isn't that interesting? The past faithfulness of God guarantees and gives confidence for them in his future faithfulness. Because he has blessed us, he will. We see this in David. Remember when David agrees to fight Goliath or volunteers to fight Goliath? He comes and he's, the reason he has confidence in the future against Goliath is because he says when he was confronted with a bear and a lion, the, uh, God uh, provided for him and helped him, protected him, helped him to overcome those enemies. The past always becomes an assurance for the future. Same thing with us. Think about it. We look back at a historic events that happened 2,000 years ago on a hill, probably near a garbage dump outside the city. A man, a seemingly poor man was crucified and we call that God. This is historic events. And because God has died, we have hope in the future. But look at what they're doing. This is where the, this, this psalm turns towards the gospel more, even more, and towards our New Testament context. Because remember, I said at the very first episode about how to read the Bible, that it's always Christocentric or Christotelic, this idea that Christ is to be found in all the scriptures. And not always overtly. Sometimes you, it's inherent and it talks about things that are like Christ and point to what he will do. And you see some of that here. Why is it that Israel, of all the people in the world, can then look after being blessed and say, we have everything. We've been blessed. We've been blessed. But we want more. It's because they're looking forward to a greater blessing. Now, the, the ancient Israelites, the psalmist writing this, didn't see the cross. Not like we see it. Because it, it's in our rearview mirror. For him, it was in the future. But he saw something. Israel knew there was something coming where God would bless them even more, that he would restore to them everything that the, that the garden had for them. And this is what they're looking forward to. They're looking ahead to a time when God shall bless us. And God shall bless us, let all the ends is a future, and it brings confidence. And the confidence of this psalm, this trust in God, this, you see how they all kind of overlap? Because it's a, it's a Thanksgiving psalm, but this confidence, it's a trust psalm in some way we're going to talk about next one. Um, and it points us ahead. And the time when it would be wh what they're seeing in part as a shadow that we see in fullness is the cross. Because they see that God one day will bless us even beyond. One day the nations will bless God. One day they will be completely contented. And that blessing, of course, comes at the cross. Where when cross shows up, cross, Christ looks up. Sorry, not when the cross. When Christ shows up, he's on the cross and he looks up. And when he looks up, he does not find God's face shining on him. He finds instead nothing. That's why he's in anguish. Why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Why have you forsaken me, O God? On the cross he cries out. Because he looks up and he has no face shining on him. We can look up and have God's face shining on us. And that is what Psalm 67 is getting at. It's saying, be thankful and prepare for, to be even more. And look forward and be thankful for what's coming. The, the, the restoration of all things when Christ comes back. Because when he does come back, you will have all of this blessing and more in your hand. Right now you have it as a promise and it's coming in, in, in fullness. And this is part of what Psalm is, the psalm is getting at. That thankfulness you should have should be pushed out to all the nations. Now, with that, thank you for the Psalm 67. Now, tomorrow uh, on the next video, what we're going to look at is Psalm 91. It's a psalm of trust and confidence. And that is a very contested psalm. Please look at it again. Everybody knows it. We often use it so poorly. 
So I'm going to maybe challenge the way you look at it. I haven't read it again uh, today, but I will. And I know um, it's a beloved psalm, but we'll talk about tomorrow. So please do your homework. Read Psalm 91. Join me back tomorrow at the YouTube channel or on our website. Go anywhere for New City Church. Again, thanks for joining me. Again, I'm Carl Santos, pastor at New City Church, and have a great day.